I'm talking about uh, Henry and Emily's contract. Thank you. Uh, it was lovely to be here, and as, as an academic, I'm used to standing in front of students who are, of course, there on sufferance, so it's nice to be here in front of a room of people who've taken the time to turn up, so that really is appreciated. Um, it's with great pleasure, then, that I'm here today to talk about the Guild of St George's connections to Walkley. Uh, just up the road at Ruskin House, as many of you will know, is the site of the museum that Ruskin established in 1875. Uh, to provide a superb educational resource to Sheffield's workers. Not far away, in Walkley Cemetery, lies the grave of its first curator. You can see the condition it used to be in. Uh, first curator, the remarkable Henry Swan, who, along with his equally remarkable wife, Emily, uh, breathed life into Ruskin's project and showed incredible commitment to widening educational access in the city. Uh, the Guild with generous assistance from the Friends of the Cemetery, have decided to do something about uh, the terrible state of Swan's grave and have commissioned two plaques to commemorate the Guild's local connections, one at the cemetery, uh, the other at Ruskin House, and I'll give you a little peek of the, uh, the plaque that's being made for Ruskin House at the end. Uh, these, are, these plaques are going to be unveiled uh, next month. That's right, isn't it? Uh, and they record an important moment in the radical history of this radical city, but also uh, it's a vibrant story of the museum, and I think this story is a, a living history with real relevance to Walkley today. I've been fortunate during research for a recent book on the Guild to have visited all of the various archives holding Guild materials uh, in the UK and the US, and to have discovered a wealth of new and often startling information about the Guild by slowly, over a period of five years, uh, putting together the pieces of a scattered but surprisingly large jigsaw puzzle of overlooked archive materials, uh, I've had to extensively revise our previous understanding of the Guild and to face some hitherto unrecognized but very serious deficiencies in the Guild's management of its lands, its agricultural estates. Um, as part of that larger revision process, I delved into the interconnected stories of the museum uh, and of uh, the Guild's unhappy agricultural experiment at Totley, which formed the subject of a talk I gave on Wednesday in Totley. It's nice, then, to be able to focus today on the much happier history of the museum here in Walkley. A talk here earlier this year by my colleague uh, Marcus Wade, some of you may have come out in February to, to see him, uh, offered valuable insights into the museum's early years. And I hope to augment that talk today by concentrating on the museum's first curators. Henry Swan is a familiar figure to, to those of us who uh, work in Guild scholarship. And he's recognized as the man who did so much to sustain the museum during its early years from its inception in 1875 until his death in 1889 when the collection was leased to Sheffield Corporation. His story, however, has not been fully told. And until recently, almost nothing has been written of his wife, Emily. So part of my job today, then, is to introduce some important but overlooked sources relating to their story and to suggest that these enrich our understanding of the museum. Uh, in order to do this, I need to briefly talk about Ruskin and to explain what the Guild was before I get on to thinking about the museum. And apologies now to anyone who came along on Wednesday. The next little bit uh, was also in, in the Wednesday talk where I um, essentially explain... Uh, Ruskin as briefly as I can, and it's a tricky job, uh, and think about the Guild of St. George. One of the things that struck me is, is how hard it is these days to communicate Ruskin's towering status in Victorian culture and the, and the amazing impact he made on its many debates. Ruskin was everywhere within the uh, Victorian period. Without formal training in art history, he became its most influential art critic arguing that appreciation of beauty leads to devotion to God and to care of the environment, to care of each other. He turned to architecture, another subject in which he had absolutely no training, and very quickly became its most prominent voice. In studies of Venetian Gothic architecture, he argued that a nation's ethical state could be judged very simply by looking at its culture. Look at the buildings, look at the art, you can tell the kind of ethical temperature of a, of a society. Decadent societies produce debased art. Reverent societies produce devotional, organic art that shows our, our love of one another, of nature, and in Ruskin's case, of God. 
Finding the ethical conditions of his own Victorian society entirely wanting, he sought to re-establish Gothic work practices and to attack the deadening effects of machine manufacture. This led him into politics and to arguing that it was the role of the state to provide conditions for cooperative, creative work and to produce goods and services that led to health and social betterment. Wealth, he argued, could only be wealth if it was used for good. Useless, shoddy, harmful goods produced for profit and in conditions that maimed or brutalised workers could only generate the opposite of wealth, for which he coined a new term, ilth. Um, it's a lovely neologism from Ruskin. Merchants, manufacturers and politicians who worshipped what he called Britannia of the market or the god on, failed in their divinely appointed leadership roles, he, he argued, and were working for the devil. Ruskin didn't hold back once he saw that something was wrong. His scathing assaults on utilitarian economics were initially scorned, but gradually inspired generations of radicals, uh, socialists, anarchists, uh, even people like Gandhi and Tolstoy, uh, and his reform proposals directly influenced Britain's modern welfare state. His collected works are complex, they're varied, they're twice as long as the Bible. Uh, it takes a lifetime to read them, I'm only part of the way through. Um, but they all suggest, I would, I would argue, that the first task of all of us is essentially to appreciate and then to, and to value beauty. Once we do so, we might, we've got the chance of becoming moral, productive individuals who are driven to protect the sources of beauty in the natural world, in the, in the built environment, and in each other. Um, while Ruskin's interventions in social affairs were, honestly, often calamitous uh, in practical terms, he believed passionately in social reform and his diagnoses of economics and social ills remain re relevant today. But it's important to add that while Ruskin inspired a whole generation of socialists, he was a Tory radical, critical of democracy, critical of communism, critical of trade unions calling instead for a benevolent dictatorship of wise leaders and obedient subjects, his politics were a contradictory mixture of savage radicalism and intense conservatism. And it was this, this odd contradictory combination, uh, more than anything else I would suggest, that condemned his pr practical social uh, projects, or many of them, to failure. So this brings us to the Guild of St George, Ruskin's most direct attempt to put his ideals into practice. By 1871, he'd simply grown tired of talking and talking and talking about reform. So he announced a national fund through which contributors might challenge Victorian society by the buying and securing of land in England, which shall not be built upon, but cultivated by Englishmen with their own hands and such help of force as they can find in wind and wave. Not steam, not electricity, not gas. Hands, wind and wave. The Guild attempted to engineer an alternative society that would manoeuvre between the perceived evils of unrestrained capitalism and revolution. These campaigning years, demonstrating the extremes of Ruskin's ca character and politics, articulated his uh, idiosyncratically Tory response to modernity. Led by Ruskin, its members or companions, there are a few companions here around the room, we're still around, uh, aspire to offer a practical alternative to Victorian economics and to revalue labour, to revalue the individual and to revalue the earth by establishing agricultural and artisanal communities which would be supported by schools, museums and libraries. Guild activities fall into three main categories. They were agricultural, educational and industrial. The industrial projects included a successful publishing company, a woolen mill, a linen industry, and a cooperative mill. Um, agriculture centered on land purchases and donations in the north, in the Midlands, and in Wales. Um, the organization, however, never lived up to Ruskin's grand hopes, failing to attract a wide membership, and it was hamstrung by its leaders' faulty politics, by authoritarian management, emotional traumas, and ill health. Uh, but its projects were often pioneering and well ahead of their time. They included things like an ethical tea shop in Paddington uh, and attempts to uh, keep the street clean in uh, St Giles in London. Um, another attempt to clean the River Wandell in Carshalton. These things were quite a long, long way, decades ahead of their time. 
The most striking success of the Guild, though, was its educational work, and its most enduring legacy was the Guild collection, originally housed in the Walkley Museum and now uh, available to all of us at the Millennium Galleries. Previous studies of the museum have primarily exploited the enormous monumental library edition of John Ruskin's works. If you want to get a copy, it's two and a half yards of bookshelf and two and a half thousand quid. Uh, Ruskin's diaries, a few contemporary accounts and obituaries and some published correspondence. But by far the largest source of information on the museum has been largely neglected, despite having been lodged in the Philadelphia archive for 60 years. This, the uh, unpublished uh, letters from John Ruskin to Henry and Emily Swan, 1855 to 1887, was purchased by the Rosenbach Museum and Library in 1953. It has cropped up in a few accounts and, and studies, but really its full range of material has barely been looked at or touched or talked about. It's a 10-volume correspondence, including over 200 letters written by Ruskin to Henry and Emily Swan, um, providing vital new details and insights and alongside other materials that I've found, uh, these transform our understanding of the museum. The Rosenbach correspondence provides a firm chronology of events for the first time about what's going on in the museum. Um, and as only correspondence really can do, it allows us to glimpse its inner workings and central relationships in a richly intimate way. You really get to know the people. Um, I can only offer a few glimpses of this invaluable source today, but if it whets your appetite, um, I'm very happy to forward the full transcription of the 10 volumes which I took <laughs> in Philadelphia uh, on a Word document to anyone who's interested and wants to follow it up. Um, it's not everyone who can get to Philadelphia. I was, I'm aware of how lucky I was, and if it's of any use to any of you, it's there. So, through this remarkable correspondence, my main task today is to give a fuller picture of the life of Henry and Emily Swan. I'd like to achieve a balanced understanding of Henry's unusual character and underline his strong connections to widening cultural access within Sheffield's uh, educational circles. Uh, but I also want to reveal the importance of Emily Swan to the museum. This is a subject that hasn't been raised before. And to argue that we should think of the museum curatorship as a partnership of talented equals. We've always known about Henry, we haven't known so much about Emily. And I particularly want to talk about her fascinating and touching relationship with Ruskin, so we'll get to that towards the end. We'll start by thinking about the ways in which we've tended to think about Henry in the past, and then trace his early life before turning to the Sheffield years. I'll use the, the Rosenbach letters throughout for their many insights into the museum, tracing its origins and development, and offering glimpses of the excitement and energy of the Ruskin-Swan collaboration. Uh, and think about the way in which that has impacted in terms of relationships with Sheffield itself. So Henry and his character. The significance of Henry Swan's Sheffield work has long been acknowledged, uh, but he is often regarded as something of a crank. Tim Holt Hilton, Ruskin's biographer, for example, notes that Ruskin teased Swan about his vegetarianism. Uh, he's an early vegetarian. While Catherine Morley points out that this Quaker convert used thee, thou, and thine in speech long after the conventional language had been made a matter of taste. He seems very old-fashioned in this sense and easy to laugh at. Uh, these and other authors imply an eccentric and sometimes even a ridiculous individual. And it's true that his well-known enthusiasms haven't helped his reputation. An 1889 obituary noted that he was one of the first to introduce the now familiar bicycle into the country, and at another time made an attempt to popularize the throwing of the boomerang. A Sheffield Independent obituary related that he was, and this I still don't understand, the inventor of a system of musical notation, and that he had also perfected a system of writing English words phonetically, as they are pronounced, while practically not altering in appearance to the ordinary reader by the systemized use of Tudor or early English letters and signs which he proposed to utilize in teaching children to read. The obituary tactfully noted that none of these inventions have been worked practically or commercially, although all might have been useful in their way. Swan, they suggested, was singularly fertile in ideas and invention, but never very successful in carrying them out, as is, as is often the case with such minds. Ruskin certainly satirized Swan's diet, his teetotalism, and various enthusiasms, but while his letters to the Swans are occasionally irritable, 
their keynotes are deep gratitude and a deep admiration for, for Henry and Emily's talents. Uh, and they're, they're, they're real work for the museum. Um, we should also note that Swan's career prior to, the, uh, to leaving the Guild Museum was successful. Everything he did before was successful. He's not some crank who's turned up and attached himself to the museum. This is a substantial um, individual who's achieved a lot in the years before. Uh, and as Andrew Russell has, uh, Andrew Russell has done valuable research on Swan's innovations in crystal cubed photography, an early form of stereoscopy. Swan, it seems, was a not inconsequential figure in Victorian photography. Uh, as, one of, as another of Swan's obituaries noted, uh, in 1860 he made an invention in photography which was very much thought of at the time, namely to make an ordinary photograph when mounted in a casket casket or case to look like a solid representation of the person photographed in the well-known stereoscopic way, but without the stereoscope, by two images superposed on looking at the case by means of the prisms inside. Another obituarist noted that it was difficult to imagine that he whom Swan saw trudging up the steep hills that abound in the neighbourhood around here, scotch cap on head and coattails flying, whilst carrying over, home over his shoulder a sack of potatoes or apples, could at one time have been a fashionable, fashionable photographer in Regent Street with Lord Bruffen and Louis Napoleon as his sitters. Uh, so he has this very interesting past in London in the, in the world of photography. And we haven't given equal weight, I think, to the two sides of Swan's character that are revealed here. No doubt he was eccentric, but he was also capable, intelligent, open-minded and generous. He's the kind of person you'd love to go back in time and meet. Mr. Swan... Uh, an obituarist noted, was emphatically a man of ideas. Here was an intellectually avaricious working class man, eager to imbibe the culture of his day and who attempted to positively influence that culture. The Henry Swan who I've come to know over the past few years was vibrant, distinctive and vigorous, a quietly energetic and self-effacing man who made a strong impression on those he met. It was impossible, the obituarist related, to visit the treasure house at Walkley without carrying away a vivid remembrance of its devoted curator. To encounter this idiosyncratic man at St George's Museum, I'd like to suggest, was a rare treat, and we should treasure him today as he treasured Ruskin's collection. Born in Devizes in 1825, Swan and his family moved to London in 1851. At this time, his father John was a bookseller, his older brother Francis was a lithographer, and Henry had begun an engraving career. So these kind of leanings drew him to Ruskin's Working Men's College, uh, Working Men's College art classes, and his, uh, his talents were quickly recognised by Ruskin, who employed him in engraving and, and colouring work in 1855. So we learned a little bit from the Rosenbach correspondence about those very early connections, and then there's a gap. The next surviving letters date from 1863 and 1870, uh, 1873. By 1860... Swan had married Emily Con uh, Connell, and the couple and their children had moved to London, uh, and they lived there for another decade. By 1873, though, uh, he'd, be, he'd moved to Sheffield. Correspondence shows that Henry became an independent silver engraver and printer, and wor was worried that his work, which probably involved supplying illustrations for local industry, was not pleasing or artistic. Uh, Ruskin attempted, not altogether successfully, to reassure him don't fret over your work, he said. Whatever you think of it, it may be useless and vulgar, but need not be deleterious. Whatever Henry's doubts, he had a family to support, and when the idea of a Sheffield Museum cropped up in 1875, Ruskin feared that a curatorship might not prove as uh, financially rewarding as Henry's engraving career. The curator's salary, he said, would be more when there's something to take care of than your present wages, but are you prepared to take a position leading to an advancement. Um, Ruskin needn't have worried. In Swan, he had found a principled and enthusiastic advocate for his ideas on uh, working men's museums. By 1875, Ruskin had been interested in this subject for decades. His work on art and architecture and his teaching experiences at the Working Men's College led him to advocate widening cultural access. An age of museum expansion led to debates about achieving working class involvement and whether this was even a good idea. 
In a lecture to working men's college students in 1865, Ruskin spoke of working men's museums with a sufficient number of good objects for them to study. Um, argue, augmenting the major national or civic museums that should act as a depository for specimens of all that was good and beautiful, you know, the British museum type museums, he advocated, in addition, a national network of museums for working men at night, when they could actually get there, uh, that should possess a quantity of things which they could use, not too many things, but what they had good in rooms well ventilated and well lighted. This is a fairly, relatively new idea in the 1870s. The provision of what he called examples which they could be allowed to handle and examine, a study museum open at times convenient to workers, and the aspiration above all to let them gain as men and not as mere hands would all transpire in Sheffield in an original experiment that consumed a great deal of Ruskin's time and money. Museums were a source of keen debate beyond uh, the capital during a period of unprecedented growth in provincial investments, in parks, libraries, and education. In this, Sheffield was particularly prominent. The presence of a trusted northern ally in Swan was probably the principal reason for choosing Sheffield for the museum, but the city was also appropriate for a number of other reasons. Um, as Robert Ewison points out, the timing of Ruskin's social appeal and his attempts to put his ideas into practice must be seen in the context of the 1870s, which saw the first stirrings of the reawakened movements of 1848, expressed in the formation of political groups, charitable settlements, and utopian communities. The city was becoming radical again after a period of quiet. David Price points to a strong radical tradition, both in terms of religious dissent and of political memories that went back to the Chartists and the Sheffield Corresponding Society, back into the 1820s, 1830s, and suggests that this was fruitful soil for those who wished to cultivate social change. Rowbottom notes that after 1870, Edward Carpenter, you can see here, um, was involved in the university extension movement in Sheffield, uh, and I think later in Leeds, and was part of a community of radicals, free thinkers, women, women's rights activists, and others who saw widening educational access as a means to promote a, promote a whole range of radical causes. The first public museum in the city opened in September 1875, a few months before Ruskin's. Uh, the Mapping Art Gallery followed in 1887, and Sheffield also boasted the uh, self-financing People's College, set up as early as 1842 to provide early morning and evening lectures, admitting women and children over eight, but offering no library facility. Meanwhile, classes at the local mechanics institutes were beginning to offer classes in basic subjects. Ruskin's museum then fed a pre-existing appetite for wider educational access while also filling gaps left by the city's emerging provision. Having described the local background a little, I'll turn now to the origins of St. George's Museum itself. The correspondence, the Rosenbach correspondence, underscores the energy and enthusiasm of Ruskin's Sheffield work. Even in, when you're reading it, you can see the handwriting is rushed and energetic and full of life. Um, and suggest that once the germ of an idea emerged, the project advanced with astonishing speed. Ruskin first promised to visit uh, Swan in Sheffield in May 1875, apparently feeling that Sheffield might offer respite from personal trauma. Ruskin's relationship with uh, Swan deepened in the months surrounding the death, of, uh, Rose Latouche, the death in May of Rose Latouche, the young woman with whom Ruskin had been, long been engaged in an agonizingly fruitless courtship. Ruskin expressed gratitude to Henry um, in early July for a long and very precious letter and noted that he had kept it by me ever since and read it for the first time yesterday passing through Sheffield where I will certainly come to see you and talk. By this point it seemed to Ruskin likely that my work really does lie there. The museum promised to fill the void left by Latouche's death but also offered an opportunity to act decisively in a familiar field after four years of frustrating guild work. The museum represented a new start for an organization that had achieved little in its first four years. By the 12th of July, uh, Ruskin spoke of, the, of a museum in a way that clearly revealed Swan's role as, as main champion and encourager of the scheme. It's very wonderful to me the coming of your letters just at this time, he told Swan. The chief point in my own mind in material of education is the getting a museum, however small, well explained, and clearly and easily seen. 
Can you get, with any Sheffield help, a room with good light anywhere accessible to the men who would be likely to come to it? If so, I will send you books and begin with minerals of considerable variety and interest, with short notes on each specimen and others of less value of the same kinds which the men may handle and examine at their ease. So the plan was initially quite modest, a room. Um, modest in scale, but ambitious in scope. And Ruskin was confident enough to announce his intention publicly in August when he said, I have become responsible as the master of the company, he's the master of the Guild of St George, uh, for rent or purchase of a room at Sheffield in which I propose to place some books and minerals as the germ of a museum arranged first for workers in iron and extended into illustration of the natural history of the neighbourhood of Sheffield and more especially of the geology and flora of Derbyshire. The Rosenbach letters provide unrivaled detail of the unfolding of the museum's acquisition, the motivation behind the purchase, and the surrounding atmosphere of excitement. We learn, for example, that by August, Swan had, and an unnamed friend had clearly tempted Ruskin to, to consider taking on something, uh, you know, a building rather than a room. I must think over your letter before answering, he told Swan. I may alter my notion of the kind of museum and adopt your friend's plan, this, this taking a building on. One essential is security from fire, and I am prepared to meet considerable expense in warming and drying walls, provided I am master of the whole place. So he's starting to get really excited at this point. A month by, uh, within a month, he was prepared to enter into treaty for the purchase of the quiet, detached piece of ground with the building thereon, if it can be bought at a price which I may justify. He had to justify everything to the trustees of the guild who didn't like spending money. On 19th of September, uh, and this is ironic because most of the money of the Guild of St George was, was provided by Ruskin, he gave £10,000 to this at the beginning. Um, on 19th of September, claiming that he would not do anything in haste at Sheffield, he gave away his own excitement by confiding to Swan that, I have got packed and entirely catalogued and described my first 30 minerals, he's ready to send them. A week later, he breathlessly told Swan that if horses can carry me through this black wind and rain, I hope to be at the Royal Hotel tomorrow uh, evening. During this visit, which came off, the two men inspected a, a cottage and land at Bellhag Road, and on the 27th, Ruskin approved the purchase. By the 12th of October, the deed was signed and £630 had been paid. The speed of the museum's acquisition, just six months from the conception of the idea, the first idea to completion, was liberating to an embattled Ruskin, but may have contributed to the museum's unorthodox location, um, high on a hill some distance from the city center. The initial site selection was largely down to Swan, but a number of other factors led to Walkley and made this in many ways the right spot, the, the absolutely appropriate spot for the museum. After a visit to the museum, Edward Bradbury wrote in pastoral mode of a garden plot of about an acre in extent with, mini with a miniature apple orchard and bushes of evergreen and old-fashioned flowers, a detached stone house that might be the residence of a country schoolmaster and a site commanding a painter's dream of scenic loveliness. You're all lucky enough to live here. <laughs> Overlooking a series of converging valleys that in their wild, uncultivated beauty are suggestive of the Alps. I'm sure you must have felt this often. Whilst being only two miles from the uh, black heart of the grimy kingdom of industry. I mean, it is a beautiful part of the world just on your doorstep. Sheila Rowbottom suggests that when Edward Carpenter uh, first moved to Sheffield in the 1870s, he landed in what she calls the midst of an environmental disaster. In the low-lying low parts of the centre, she said, not only was the sun frequently blocked by pollution, uh, terrible smells, uh, there we go. this is the Sheffield station, at the time. Uh, terrible smells rose from untreated sewage and rubbish and acid dust took its toll, causing high rates of pulmonary and bronchial illness. Uh, while the better off people evaded the smog by building their homes upon one of the town's hills, Ruskin's entry into Sheffield had all the symbolic power of St. George meeting a smoke-breathing dragon. From its lofty vantage point, the museum could peer down on the malign manifestations of modernity sending a pointed message about the value of a pristine environment, healthy air, precious objects, and difference. As Ruskin told Times readers in 1883, the mountain home of the museum at Walkley was originally chosen not to keep the collection out of smoke 
but expressly to beguile the artisan out of it. The location offered opportunities to escape the polluted lowlands, but as Stuart Eagles, who's sitting over here, uh, wisely argues, um, the museum offered Sheffielders something even greater than the opportunities um, afforded to the privileged undergraduates at Oxford who Ruskin was teaching. For what awaited those prepared to climb the Walkley Hill were the finest examples of drawing, engraving, illumination, architecture, sculpture, painting, crystallized gems, precious stones, and jewelry, as well as a small library of fine books. Ruskin, an alpine enthusiast, hoped that the difficult climb to the museum's treasures would inspire the devout tenacity of pilgrims. Um, so uh, an appropriate location, I think, in many ways. But the choice of a Welkley also reflected a, a fierce independence that saw Ruskin entirely fail to foster good local relations. Uh, in November, uh, November 1875, uh, notoriously prickly Ruskin indicated that he had received a letter very well and kindly meant from Mr. Bragg, who was a leading city councillor, offering me space in the existing Sheffield Museum for whatever I chose to put there. His reply to this generous offer was far from kindly. I am obliged by your note, he wrote, but the work of the St. George's Company is necessarily distinct from all other. My museum may be perhaps nothing but a two-window garret, but it will have in it nothing but what deserves respect in art or admiration in nature. A great museum in the present state of the public mind is simply an exhibition of the possible modes of doing wrong in art and an accumulation of uselessly multiplied ugliness in misunderstanding nature, it doesn't hold back. <laughs> your Sheffield Ironwork, this is the pièce de resistance, your Sheffield Ironwork department will necessarily contain the most barbarous abortions that human rudeness has ever produced with human fingers. The understandably emphatic civic response was not long in coming. Bragg read Ruskin's letter at a dinner which followed the opening of Western Park Museum to the public on September the 6th, 1875. You can imagine it went down well. Uh, and Bragg is reported that it had almost prompted him to say, much learning hath made him mad. Hardly a good start. Two days later, the Sheffield Daily Telegraph carried an angry article attacking Ruskin's insult to civic pride. While he struggled to cultivate local links, Ruskin's response to Bragg also underlined something that's important, which is his distinctive aesthetic and organisational vision. You know, he's actually right about museums. Um, for good or ill, Walkley, the Walkley Museum would indeed be necessarily distinct from the city's civic museums and would reflect Ruskin's distinctive approach to museum display, a real hands-on approach. By October 1875, Swan's role was becoming clear in all of this. Uh, Ruskin, you and your wife seem to have been to Sheffield to take care of the place. Anxious to answer for the welfare of the family, but painfully aware of financial restraints arising from a lack of available guild funds, he promised ongoing improvements in their situation. I'm quite sure I can find work for you to the value of your present earnings with a rent-free house, but I don't think I can promise much advance. And I shall build a convenient, though small, curator's house as money comes in and clear the museum wholly. So the original plan was to live in the museum, and that's actually what continued to happen. A £40 annual starting salary was agreed for the start of one's uh, curatorship in November, and it, was, uh, it rose to £100 in 1877, uh, which is not bad for the time. A separate house was never built, but Ruskin was a considerate employer, acquiring extra land and building extensions to the cottage in order to provide more living space. Conditions remained notoriously cramped. Swans were uh, also uh, entirely almost entirely uncomplaining. So we get it, the museum started, I want to give you just a flavour of the kinds of uh, activities that were going on early on as, as things got going. In November 1875, Ruskin fired off his first orders for the museum and was caught, as he would be throughout the museum project, between the limited funds of the Guild and his ambitious dreams for the collection. He overcame this rather simply by, simply, uh, by generously dipping into his own pockets. Enormous money went into this. Um, 
with a clear vision of what he wanted, at the end of 1875 saw him buzzing with plans for frames, cases, and bird stuffing. None of the stuffed birds have survived, sadly. And the new year set a pattern of frenetic activity that continued for years as Ruskin accumulated materials, packed them off to Sheffield, and gave orders to the swans as to their care and display. After much indecision, he settled on a design for the museum's mineral cabinet. Sadly, these were also now lost. Uh, but there's beautiful drawings of the, them that Ruskin provides in the, in the correspondence uh, with these beautiful detailed diagrams and instructions um, as to their construction. The art collection was mostly assembled later. It became enormous, but the early years of the museum were dominated by geology. On the 14th of May, 1876, in a typical missive to Swan, Ruskin noted that he was glad to hear of safe arrival of the first fine minerals, and he provided extremely precise instructions as to their display. His pleasure in gems was matched by his attention to detail. Innumerable logical dispatches followed. You can see the kind of list of, of uh, items and the instructions that come with them. This is just one of many uh, sets of instructions. So you get these, these innumerable geological dispatches following, including an opal of exceeding beauty and rarity, Transylvanian moss gold and two pound, two pound beryl. Uh, he told Swan that the glassed space and drawers of the cabinets are to be filled with the richest silk purple velvet as you have stones for them, and instructed that the numbers in the glass case are to be worked on little separate velvet squares in gold thread. This was work at which Emily excelled. Uh, we'll come on to Ellie, Emily properly, but this is where he begins to recognize Emily's talent. Ruskin's stringent instructions, as we see here, uh, insisted on practical, educational, and aesthetic display and demonstrated his commitment to the provision of fine, instructive specimens for workers. Um, one begins to sympathize a little uh, for the swans during this length, what became a lengthy period of mineral bombardment. Um, but it must have been deeply exciting too. The frequent arrival of new items tested their abilities to, to deal with it all, but they also took their responsibilities very seriously. Um, they needed to be flexible and determined, for they essentially never knew what Ruskin was going to be sending next or whether he would command new methods of cataloging and display. In August 1876, for example, they had to respond immediately to the results of uh, Ruskin's recent visit to Barmouth in the form of two boxes of our geological series. The swans were to take care of the labelled specimens already catalogued and to work with Ruskin's various experiments on modes of labelling, to deal with a large box with five specimens, one vast one, to be unpacked with extreme care for which a stand would have to be made to keep its cracked corner from coming off. So they recover from this. Having accommodated all of this, they suddenly get this list of new... Um, which is a letter from pa Paris. He's posted things from all over the country as he travels around, as you can see. And the, these are just a couple of examples, uh, amongst countless others, which chart the ar arrival of endless treasures in the form of minerals, paintings, books, prints, casts. It's no surprise that the swans found difficulties in finding space for themselves oh. at Walkley, uh, or that Ruskin had to house parts of the collection throughout the country. It's not entirely clear how successful the museum was. Some sources claim it was largely ignored by uh, Sheffielders, but most suggest that it thrived and, and attracted uh, visitors from Sheffield, from across the country, in fact, from as far away as Canada, New York, Australia, even China. Um, whatever the numbers, the visitor experience at Walkley was enlivened and enriched by the cura curator. Uh, William Allen relates that as the number of students and spectators daily increased, uh, Swan took great pains that they should derive real instructions from the examples collected in the single room in which they were at first exhibited. The Sheffield Museum opened from nine till nine every day, except Sundays when it was available two till six, uh, and Thursdays when it was closed. The presence of the swans on site for extended hours was a vital element of the, of the success of the museum. Gentle voice, assuming and enthusiastic as he was, it was very quaint and pleasing to hear the gifted friend Henry, tutoya a visitor to the museum whilst giving all the assistance he could to the understanding of its precious contents, which he loved so well. He was strongly imbued with the Ruskin spirit, uh, and it was often remarked that to listen to the descriptions was like reading a few pages of Ruskin, so characteristic and cleverly appropriate were his utterances. He would take as much pains with those who could not appreciate what they saw as he would with a distinguished visitor, such as the late Duke of Albany. 
Swan understood Ruskin's desires to vis uh, for, Rus for visitors to make connections between diverse objects, to learn by touching, feeling, drawing, and reading, and to find themselves in the objects of study, and made it his life's work to make the seemingly cluttered rooms of the museum a place of imaginative escape from the everyday realities of Sheffield working life. Um, I'm aware of the time, but I've got a section on Emily. Have I got time to do Emily before I finish? You sure? Good, because it'd be a shame to miss Emily. Okay, good. I'm happy to go on all night, but, uh, you know. Um, so I want to turn now to Emily Swan's role at the museum. Ruskin's 30 letters to Emily underline her important practical role at Walkley and, in, and, and her invaluable emotional support. Ruskin's first rather stiff letter to her came in January 1876, not long after the opening of the museum, but by March he was confident enough in her abilities to send details and instructions to her rather than Henry. Uh, it's clear that he valued Emily's extremist care in handling and presenting items. Um, he wrote to Henry um, in a April 1877 of a valuable cast. You can see some of the casts actually in the Millennium Galleries at the moment. Adding, I want Emily to devise some way of keeping it from whitening what it touches and then to put it in a case on a red silk cushion or backing. A few months later, he sent a box of ex exquisite flint fossils with instructions that Emily must handle them with her best and daintiest care. So she's really important to Verskin's vision, to the aesthetic vision of the museum. He was impressed by her intelligence too, and rather mysteriously telling Henry in 1878 that it was very clever of Emily guessing those Holbein pictures. I don't really know what he's talking about, but uh, he's obviously impressed by her intelligence. Referring in June 1877 to a letter from Emily, he told her that the paragraph on women's dress is of great value to me, and the account of the museum delightful, especially in the part referring to the curators, adding, or curators, I fancy it ought to be. So by then he's thinking of her um, and recognizing her impact on the museum's organization and aesthetics. And he increasingly thought of, of them as, as a partnership of equals. Promising to send the swans a lovely old German Bible with woodcuts rudely copied indeed uh, and full of interest in life, he told Henry that you and Emily uh, sorry, you and the curatress will have a fine time making them all out. So by this time, she's the curatress. She's not just Emily. By not giving due attention to the Rosenbach correspondence, we've entirely missed Emily, uh, Emily's significance and have lost opportunities to eavesdrop on what is a fascinating relationship uh, with Ruskin that went beyond uh, museum matters. For Ruskin, Emily was a positive, provocative person, equally liable to delight and infuriate him, but someone who always made him think Neither predictable nor staid, it was, it was her liveliness that produced strong responses in a man who was growing weary and hidebound in his views. In June 1877, he praised the bright spirit and good help of one of her missives, and a few months later, he told Henry that he found Emily's indignant letter delightful. As his health and happiness declined after 1878, he found her youthful vibrancy a touching counterpoint to his own declining mental state. And, and this is very clear in my favourite letter from the correspondence, where he says, My dear Emily, you are a nice creature, but in your effervescent life and youthfulness have extreme difficulty in getting any notion of my faded and grey twilight of temper and feeling how like you are to a lamb skipping before a broken, winded old horse to please it. And I, I love the fact that he adds, all the same, it does please it. Sometimes his ego emerged in overbearing corrections of her ideas and character, but when it became clear that these had pained her, he wrote reassuringly, I got your little note written in August till today, and I'm so very sorry not to have answered. When did any feelings of this kind come into your head? What possible fault could there be in anything you ever said or thought to me? I called you gushing and romantic. He calls her gushing and romantic quite a lot. But as to anything needing to be forgiven, there was no word of yours that could for an instant be so mistaken. You can see he really has a, has a feeling for Emily. Their strong connection deepened further in 1878 uh, when they simultaneously suffered episodes of psychiatric illness. In August, he told her that we must stick up for each other now after we've both been crazy together. A day later, in a letter to Henry, he passed on his kindest regards to Emily and his hope that we shall both in future look well after our wits. A month later, Ruskin sent the only example in all of the correspondence of any anger towards Emily. This is a time of extreme pressure on him. 
Um, essentially, she'd, she'd bothered him with trifling questions about the towels in the museum and, and had inquired about the possibility of museum users coming to visit Ruskin's own personal collection of Turners uh, in, the, in the Lake District. And he wrote to her, I've just got home from the Highlands and find your letter towel. The letter shows I think you are still far from well, for which I am sorry. Please understand, however, now once for all that I am far from well too, and that with all the same feelings to my friend I've ever had, I must be let alone just now, and that nobody is on any pretext whatever to trouble me with needless business concerning bath towels or any other thing. With regard to the pictures, Ruskin complained that I should have an excursion train daily from Liverpool, Leeds, Manchester and Birmingham if I let them be seen, and insisting that they can't be seen. He advised her to put them out of your head. The fragility of his mind at this point in 1878 is clear in his final injunction. If you could but think a little whenever you feel inclined to do so or allow anything to be done that concerns me, that you are knocking at the door of a sick chamber and had better be sure first that you heard the bell or will go much more smoothly in future. This is an unusual moment, but clearly the pressure was on. No permanent rift ensued, and by January 1879, Ruskin was concerned enough to ask Henry whether she had recovered from the towel affair yet. <laughs> Relations quickly resumed as before, with Ruskin writing to her in May to say that it's very pretty of you to be so sorry, but you know I've often told you lately that you were a little goose, and so you are. In those later darker years, Ruskin was increasingly given to mood swings, and this is evident in some of the later letters to Emily. In, 18, in April 1879, Ruskin, the son of a sherry merchant, wrote to her that you are both of you very good but considerable geese in attempting to defend teetotalism to me after what I have written of it. It humiliates me to find all my St. George people more or less idiotic. But two days later, he wrote to declare himself heartily glad of your note today and to acknowledge that your last gave me more to think of than was good for me. So there's very much mood swings here. So in closing this final section on Emily, I'd like to that Emily is only one of several distinctive, talented, and significant female figures within the early guild who repay closer attention than they have sometimes received. So in closing, what have we learned of the swans? The energetic and active role played by Henry Swan in ensuring that the museum got underway and thrived, she's clear. The Rosenbach correspondence reveals the powerful and often joyous alliance forged between Ruskin and his chef allies, as well as the skillful devotion with which museum work was undertaken, and the indomitable spirit and hopeful enthusiasm that clearly mo uh, motivated the Swans. I also hope to have done something to counter a tendency to uh, somewhat uh, caricature Henry Swan's uh, character and his achievements, and to have given some impetus to subsequent studies of the important role played by the remarkable Emily as an equal partner at Walkley. Correspondence and related items also offer unique windows into the culture of Sheffield and its social, political, and educational aspirations. They underline the strange appropriateness um, of Ruskin's choice of the city for his most prominent guild project, as well as the ways in which the Swans responded to Sheffield and became part of its fabric and culture. More than anything else, I hope to have given you some indication of the characters of Henry and Emily Swan and an inclination to get to know them a little better. The best summation of the spirit in which the couple worked is to be found in the Sheffield Independent Obituary for Henry, uh, which is here. And this, by the way, is the plaque that will be on Ruskin Museum next month. It's not quite finished, as you can see, but it's going to be a, a beautiful thing. Uh, so this is, this is Henry Swan. He forwarded by explanation and all means in his power the social and art teachings of Mr. Ruskin, carried out as far as possible to arrangement and exhibition of Mr. Ruskin's art treasures, and in connection with Mrs. Swan and the whole of his family, strove to bring home to Sheffield and the world in general the teachings of helpfulness and beauty and joy in life, which are the great principles in Mr. Ruskin's life and writings. In all that the Guild are currently doing in Sheffield, and that all that you are all doing, in your own activities. I hope we can all follow the example of Henry and Emily Swan and bring their work, their ideals, their enthusiasm into the present moment and to insist with them that the world of art and beauty is not or shouldn't be uh, a separate elite place, separate from everyday life, but should be uh, an integral part of ordinary life for all, uh, and accessible to all members of our communities and of our society. Thank you.